Today I want to continue the discussion of identification that we began last time. What I looked at last time was, in the first instance, the basic ideas underlying identification of econometric models. And then I looked at the situation which arises when we complicate the classic static model by time series features. And I looked in some detail at an autoregressive model illustration. What I want to start with today is just briefly to look at the identification concept in time series models and then look at some results uh, which relate to the econometric model with moving average errors as opposed to the autoregressive error case which I looked at last time. If we think about the simplest case of a time series model with which I began some time ago, that is for a univariate um, process, then I was writing this in standard form uh, like that, and we were referring to this particular process as an autoregressive moving average process of order PQ. In the time series literature, uh, and in particular in the book by Box and Jenkins, they regard the identification problem simply as that of selection of appropriate values of these two specifying integers, p and q. And so, in effect, the identification problem in this particular context is simply that of selecting some member of the general class of model defined by the autoregressive moving average models with some value of P and Q. <coughs> the basic idea is uh, then for a particular sample to choose um, these particular values, choose P and Q, given, say, some sample Y1 through Yt. And the standard procedure is uh, described in, in the book by Box and Jenkins as an iterative one, that is, one makes a first guess at appropriate values of P and Q, uh, estimates the process for that uh, choice, and uh, look at, looks at the results. If the results look fine, then that's the end of the search. <coughs> if they don't look so good, maybe they themselves suggest, the results that is, uh, an alternative choice of P and Q, and so on through an iterative procedure until some particular choice is made for which the estimated model has properties which correspond closely to the theoretical properties of a model of that kind. That is to say, what we're looking for in practice is a particular choice of values of P and Q such that the theoretical properties of that model, as estimated from the sample, correspond to the observable features of the sample, in particular autocovariances, for example, and also properties of the residuals are paid attention to. So in other words, in this, in this original specification, it's required that the error terms epsilon t be white noise, and we would require then that in an empirical choice of p and q and the corresponding estimated model, the residuals of such a model should also approximate white noise. So basically, that's the uh, uh, procedure. Box and Jenkins uh, are, are responsible for one particular phrase, which I don't think is particularly elegant, so I don't mind continuously laying it at their door. And that is parsimonious parameterization. Parsimonious param parameterization means, other things being equal, choose P and Q as small as possible. There is one solid statistical ground for doing this, which illustrates the connection with identification in the sense in which I earlier mentioned it, and that arises from the following consideration. If we multiply the original ARMA model on both sides by some other polynomial 
uh, factor, then the result, the resulting model, is observationally indistinguishable from the original model. And so in a sense, for any value of this common factor, the models are observationally equivalent. All right? And so what we would say is that this, uh, such a model, let's say EG, this is observationally equivalent. And so other things being equal, we would seek to eliminate the common factors on both sides of this equation and choose the representation which had no such common factors, which in other words had P and Q as small as possible. Now this seems sensible on prior grounds, that is to eliminate what is after all redundant specification within this particular model. And there is also a very sound uh, practical ground for doing so, which is as the following. If we try to estimate a model which is of this form, that is which does have common factors on both sides of the equation, then notice that any particular numerical value of the psi factors is equally acceptable. Okay, so we're not simply talking about an algebraic relationship, we're talking about a relationship within which any particular numerical value here is equally acceptable. And in the context of maximum likelihood estimation, that would mean that the likelihood function would not contain uh, a unique maximum. We would, in effect, find that the likelihood function had what one might think of as a ridge corresponding to values of these parameters. And any particular point on that ridge would be equally acceptable. And one would expect that in the context of conventional nonlinear optimization procedures, one would, one would burn up a lot of computer time until uh, one had discovered exactly what the situation was. And so we would then in practice regard um, the parsimonious parameterization argument being to eliminate common factors of this form. OK. Well, now, if we think about not the univariate process, but the multiple time series case, then life gets a little bit more interesting. So let's move on to that and discuss the vector equivalent process. That is written in my notation. B of L y t is equal to A of L epsilon t. <coughs> and think about this particular formulation. Uh, so let's take some simple cases <laughs> to begin with. Um, first of all, the moving average process, as, we, uh, as I noted initially, is in need of some normalization. And the normalization I'll choose is that the leading moving average coefficient matrix is the unit matrix. And we shall also take, for initial purposes, the leading autoregressive coefficient matrix to be the unit matrix, which means, in other words, that we're working with a situation which is analogous to the econometric reduced form. OK, there is no uh, instantaneous causality, instantaneous feedback within this particular model once I make that specification. So in other words, we're talking about reduced form type situations. And in this context, what we see is that once again, exactly as in the autoregressive error specification, a reduced form type identification problem exists. Um, as before, we shall make some uh, stability, invertibility type assumptions, <coughs> namely that the two corresponding determinantal polynomials have all their zeros in the right place. have zeros outside unit circle. OK, so that's the basic um, you mean, uh, framework. You mean zeros in or outside the unit, on or outside the unit? Which one, Bob? Z of A of Z? Um, well, uh, I might want to uh, 
I suppose, from a mathematical point of view, allow them actually to be on the unit circle, but um, I suppose that has probability zero, and it's so inconvenient when it happens Why? that I'm I mean, keen to convenient rule it out. For estimation, That's right. For purely the identification part of it, in the same way as for the univariate case, uh, you, you can't distinguish between, say, zeros inside and outside the unit circle, but on the unit circle, everything is okay for A and Z. Mm. Well, I'll stick to that statement. Um, and p if, if you want to put in your notes <laughs> on or outside, <laughs> I don't mind. Uh, but I'll stick to this statement, maybe not for the identification purposes, but because uh, statistical inference gets pretty awkward, if that happens to be the case. Uh, OK, the uh, autocovariances that we looked at originally, say uh, CK, uh, just the things of this form, um, if you like, cross-lagged covariance, as I think they're called in the uh, sociological model building literature. Um, there is a generating function for these things, exactly analogous to the generating functions that we looked at previously. And in this particular case, it's of this form, <coughs> B of Z inverse A of Z omega A of Z to the minus 1 transpose B prime. OK. Omega, I guess, uh, is, as defined before, the covariance matrix of the epsilons. Now, exactly as in the case that I mentioned last time, uh, what we're interested in, basically, is the possibility of being able to factor this function uniquely. That is, given the second moments, given the information in the data, the question arises, can we obtain unique estimates of these uh, A's and B's? And basically, exactly as in that case, what we're anxious to eliminate is the possibility of inserting in here, between the B and the A, and correspondingly over here, a factor of the form um, F times its inverse, which of course drops out uh, in this autocovariance generating function, but nevertheless would leave us with terms which could be associated in turn with the A and the B. Now that, in a sense, is a common factor type of argument exactly like the situation we have here in the univariate case. What we said here is that other things being equal, we would choose to eliminate common factors of this kind. And likewise, in the multiple time series case, what we in effect need to do is to eliminate the possibility of inserting such factors here also. So the possibility, say, of inserting f of z to the minus 1, f of z basically in here, and a corresponding uh, term over on the right. So we need to eliminate the possibility of that uh, to give a unique representation. So there is a prime consideration in this particular case, isn't there? And uh, that consideration is, uh, unlike the scalar case, uh, you also have to make sure that you don't insert, that you can insert in a emission matrix, a unitary, uh, a unitary matrix. Because uh, if you take B of Z to the minus 1, A of Z, omega to the half, you want to make sure that when you, you can't insert a unitary matrix after the omega to the half. Right. And, uh, okay. that's, that's distinct uh, from the scalar case where... Yeah. Uh, the, the possibility exists, I guess, of thinking of alternative parameterizations, in effect, for the moving average process. I mean, in, in effect, by... And I've chosen one. Yeah, in effect, by, cho by choosing those two conditions, you virtually eliminate that emission factor. Yeah. Good. <laughs> so your point is that there is the point. 
Well, the point is that's where it becomes necessary. Is yeah, it'll come in later on. Don't worry. Um, Okay, well now basically this is the case, this is the model dealt with in the first of the two Hannon papers which I referred to on the uh, list of references. And so let me first um, state the conditions as he does in that paper and then um, spend a bit of time uh, putting the details in between the lines of that paper on the assumption that I'm not the only one who finds the statement of the conditions uh, a little oblique. Okay, well, the, what, we sh what he shows in the, terms that, uh, in the terms in which you'll find it in there, a necessary condition, necessary and sufficient conditions, are that a, a greatest common left divisor, whatever that is, of uh, B of Z and A of Z is the unit matrix. G, I'm assuming, is the dimension of this process, as, as uh, in my notation all the way along. Um, and again, taking the statement exactly as it's in the paper, the null spaces of um, AQ and BP have null intersection. Well, let's <coughs> okay. So those are the conditions. Uh, Q and P are again the uh, orders of a chosen representation of the vector kind. So, in other words, we're talking in terms of A, Q, and B, P. Are we talking about the highest order coefficient matrices on the two sides of the representation? Um, if we are interested in, in trying to interpret these conditions in terms of restrictions on the possible transformation matrix F, uh, then it turns out that we can do so, but I shall spend a little bit of time putting in some basic ideas about uh, the relevant polynomial matrices in order that we can understand exactly what these uh, conditions have to say. Basically, we should say, However, a sufficient condition, as far as the first statement is concerned, is that these two determinantal polynomials that I defined here originally have no common factor. Okay? So if these two things have no common factor, that's a sufficient condition for the first of these two statements. And so that can again be regarded as a parsimonious parameterization type of argument. Okay? Um, this, a condition, sufficient condition for the second part of the statement is that either one or the other of these two matrices be non-singular. Okay? And so again, in, in some sense, which I shall try to make more precise in a moment, uh, there is the idea that if these highest order matrices were themselves singular, that is relatively empty, in some sense the dependence of, of that order that is, the, the, the specific need for a P and a Q in this mo autoregressive moving average representation is relatively weak. OK, well, now what I want to do is to uh, look at this in terms of seeking restrictions on these matrices F, that is, on the admissible transformations. Um, and the first condition, in effect, restricts the admissible transformation F, that is, thinking of this insertion of factors here as a transformation of the original model, what we shall see is that the first of these two statements restricts that in a particular way. <laughs> namely, it restricts the polynomial matrix to be a very special kind of polynomial matrix, namely one whose determinant is a constant. So although it's a polynomial itself, its determinant is a constant, and such a matrix is known as a unimodular matrix. And uh, let me now um, look at this in terms of those uh, polynomial matrix operations. So what I want to do then is view in terms of restrictions on F of L and the let's say the first condition restricts 
f. Maybe I'll, I'll keep the argument in for a while. Uh, to be unimodular. I.e., uh, its determinant is a constant. Yeah. Actually, actually, for that particular theorem and for most of the theorem in the paper, the unimodular condition is irrelevant. And in fact, the transformation you should be considering is f to f z of to the minus one h of z, because there is a possibility that a of z and b of z already have a common factor, and if you eliminate a common factor that common factor and then multiply by another common factor, you want to you want to eliminate that. So in fact the transformation between two structures is uh, is a rational matrix rather than a polynomial matrix that you want to reduce to a unimodular matrix. Well maybe uh, uh, I'm I, I d I would be unwilling to start set off with a with, with a model of this representation which already contained common factors. You, you see that unimodularity is really irrelevant because all you need is that the transformation between two structures is a polynomial matrix. You never use unimodularity in that particular thing. Well, we shall see. When I get, when I get to the end, you tell me where I needn't have done it. Uh, let me give some terminology. Again, on the assumption that some of this has not been met before by at least part of the audience. Um, terminology and definitions. With apologies if everybody in the audience has seen all of this before. Um, let's suppose that we have a sequence of uh, operator matrices or polynomial matrices which can be factored in a particular way, like this. And I shall use this then to define some of the basic ideas that I'm interested in. Sorry, A1 there. And suppose also that um, for the second, um, for a second matrix operator, there is also the same factorization first uh, taking out a factor f, and then possibly breaking that down into f1 and f2. And then let me use these uh, relationships to introduce the uh, basic terminology that we're interested in, although it's uh, slightly, uh, or strikes me slightly more high powered than is actually necessary. Anyway, f, in this case, we refer to as a left divisor of A. So that's the first uh, element in this statement. Equivalently, A is a right multiple of f. OK. Not only is, does f uh, satisfy that property, that is to say, of being a factor in this particular sense of the matrix A, but so is f1. All right. Um, so let's make a note of that as well. And since the same relations are postulated to hold for the matrices A and B, that is, we could repeat this, these last statements, um, F being a left divisor of B also, since we have this particular factorization for B. And so also is F1, because we have the second factorization in exactly the same way for B. Then we would speak of F or F1 being common left divisors of A and B. So there is this particular sense in which uh, these two matrices are common factors of the polynomial matrices A and B. So let's say that the same is true for both F and F1.
so those are the that's three terms in the in the mysterious uh, greatest common left divisor definition and so all we need now is some some notion of the uh, the sort of highest common denominator um, principle sort of principle and that can we can define as follows by saying if a common left divisor abbreviating common left divisor to CLD is a right multiple of all others then it is the greatest uh, common left divisor um, so in this case oh that's sorry let me complete this, say, this statement um, then it is the GCLD which I'd uh, abbreviate rather than writing out over and over again uh, from my original statement here, the greatest common left divisor, abbreviating that to, to GCLD. So if in this particular illustration here, F and F1 are the only common left divisors that we've identified in this particular way, then since F has the factorization F1, F2, Okay, F itself then is a right multiple of the other common left divisor F1, then the greatest common left divisor is F itself. Okay, so if um, uh, F1 and F are the only ones then F is itself, as I say, equal to F1, F2 as a reminder, is the uh, the GCLD of A and B. Now, in order to understand uh, basically why we choose, or Hannan presents in the paper, this basic uh, statement of, as it were, the, uh, the no factorization condition, because you can see what we're saying in effect in the statement of the result that the greatest common left divisor should be the unit matrix, okay, that is that we cannot extract a polynomial matrix from those uh, two operators. Uh, in order to see that, we can relate the idea of a greatest common left divisor to unimodular matrices, as originally stated, by citing some further results. Okay, in order to do that, uh, we note, let me use this note, let me use the symbol U for a unimodular matrix. Again, dropping the argument, maybe I ought not to do that so cheerfully. Uh, so these are all, there's brackets Z everywhere or brackets L, depending on which interpretation you prefer. Um, so is its inverse, which means that we can insert, um, in a sense, insert factors, again taking the product of a unimodular matrix and its inverse into statements of this form, again without necessarily altering the greatest common left divisor result. And that helps us a little way along. So let's say if F is the thing that we've been talking about so far, a GCLD of A and B, so is F times any unimodular matrix, since we can always, as it were, insert the factor, say A, which we're assuming has a left divisor F, we can always write this as in that form. So what this means then is that since we can specify a unimodular matrix pretty easily, there are in fact infinitely many of them, then there are for a given uh, pair of matrices, A and B, infinitely many greatest common left divisors, all connected through relationships of this form with an arbitrary choice of the matrix U. Um, 
So that's the next statement then. Um, let's say there are an infinity of U's, hence of GCLDs. I'll excuse the slightly cryptic statement. Um, now the final notion uh, that that I want. Um, to to uh, cover, if A and B have no non-unimodular factor, let's say, i.e., a GCLD. Let's say no GCLD, which is not unimodular. Then we can say, then we shall say that they're relatively left prime. That is, there is no factor which can be extracted. Uh, and for that, in effect, we have an alternative statement of a condition, namely, a necessary and sufficient condition is that if we just look at the matrix, say, A of Z, B of Z, OK, we augment, we construct the augmented matrix, um, in this case, G rows, 2G columns, then we require that that thing has full rank for any particular value of the argument Z. Um, so let's say, uh, well, is that that be a full rank? So in a sense, if you think of standard scalar algebraic arguments, what again comes out is the notion that this uh, has no factor that can be easily removed. Well, now. The final step, steps to get to the condition in the form in which Hannan gives it, namely that the, un, that the uh, greatest common left divisor be the unit matrix, is to make the following observations. First of all, the unit matrix itself is a right multiple of any unimodular matrix. Let's say by U inverse. And uh, as we've already seen, if we have some greatest common left divisor, um, then so also is the original matrix F times the uh, a unimodular matrix, as I indicated initially over there. And so if F itself then immediately we see the um, statement in the form in which Hannon gives it. OK, so what we see through these arguments or through these interrelationships that we can state the condition in a variety of ways. In effect, the form in which uh, it's given in the paper is that the unit matrix be this greatest common left divisor. What we've argued then through these uh, contortions is that this is, in effect, a restriction that the polynomial matrices, again, remembering we can put Z or L or whatever you choose in there, is to in in ensure that the polynomial matrix transformations have this particular uh, unimodular property. So in effect, this is, these are all equivalent statements, in effect, of this relatively left prime condition. Um, again, as I mentioned at the outset, loosely a vector generalization of the parsimonious parameterization idea. OK, so in effect, then, the first, condition, the first statement of that, those results gets us down to this particular restriction on admissible transformations. 
And the second statement can be seen as a way of finally removing the possibility of a polynomial transformation at all, even one with this very special property. And let's see how we... Uh, sorry, let me complete. Before I see how we do that, let me just complete this uh, statement, which is to say, and this is how Hannan gives the relatively left prime condition. It may make for shorter papers to give it that way, but it doesn't necessarily reach the largest audience. OK, carry on then. No. Now, um, consider the unimodular transformation. Just let me take a simple case. Um, say u, which is, say, u0 plus u1l. So in other words, it's just the first uh, degree polynomial matrix. And of course, the requirement is that the determinant of this matrix be a constant, that is, not be a polynomial involving the lag operator l in this case. And so one simple way to do that is to make the u1 matrix singular. OK, so e.g., since I shall have a little example, needless to say, in a moment or two, if we take a two-equation example, then I might, for example, let u be, say, a, a unit matrix for u0 and a relatively simple singular matrix for uh, u1, say, for any value of the quantity delta. Uh, that matrix has the property that I'm interested in. And note the U1 matrix here is implicitly uh, con constructed from the same two columns minus delta delta, minus delta delta there. OK, so that's a simple sort of thing that I'm talking about. And what we would say now is that we would expect that the specification of the orders in the moving average and autoregressive operators would implicitly rule out factors of this, uh, transformations of this kind. That is to say, if we um, s s said what the values of P and Q were, then we might expect that that would do the trick. Um, in particular, in this simple example, rule out a non-zero value of delta. Because on multiplying through B of L and A of L by, this, by even this simple transformation, it would seem that the result would be a polynomial of degree P plus 1 when we take U times B and Q plus 1 when we take U times A because we would basically be picking up an extra power of L on multiplying through by U1L. In fact, this, isn't, this doesn't quite do the trick, as we shall see. Basically, it would appear to rule out U1 non-zero unless the coefficient of the highest term in L happened to be zero. So let's say unless that's the last term in the transformed autoregression side, and this is the last term, that is the coefficient of L to the Q plus 1 in the transformed moving average side, unless those two things happen to be null. Okay, because the argument being uh, the the resulting transform model has degrees p plus one q plus one, and has have we has we've given numerical values there that would rule that out. Well, now um, that isn't quite the case. Um, 
for example, let, well, let me give an example thus for um, BP or AQ of the form, of the standard form, let's just say A, B, C, D, we would, even this simple singular matrix doesn't do the trick, that is U1 times this is uh, delta times a matrix admittedly singular, but certainly non-zero. And so in practice, we would need to specify, um, it would seem that this could only arise, we could only get zero here, either in the case of a totally null matrix or in the specification delta equals zero, which is, of course, the restriction we're after in order to reduce this particular admissible, apparently admissible transformation to a constant uh, to a constant matrix. Um, well, the simple case, the simple counterexample to give is to suppose that both these things are singular. Um, so let's say that this is not necessary. Um, suppose both are singular. That is. Uh, Sticking with my two equation example, um, B just has one, the highest order coefficient matrix just has one non zero term, and the same is true for A. That is, there is just one non zero coefficient. Again, this is not unrealistic, I suspect, in many practical situations, because one might expect that the longest lag of any variable in any equation. Mm -hmm. Was relatively <coughs> was relatively rare. However, this still um, uh, forces the delta to be zero for the order to be preserved. Um, clearly, if we just look at uh, one of these products, um, then we just have delta into minus alpha again certainly a non-null matrix. So let's say the same being true for A, and this forcing <coughs> in particular, you see, although the two highest coefficient matrices are singular, the existence of this single coefficient in each of them does the trick. And so basically what we need to do is to combine the two matrices together in order to derive an appropriate condition. And it's in this form that Hannon gives the second of the two statements for identifiability of the original model. And so basically then what we have is, in general, the NSC, just to repeat the conditions I wrote, uh, basically here, I think. Um, I should have left up. So the necessary con and sufficient conditions are, then, to summarize, IG be a GCLD of A and B. Let me keep putting those L's in. And the second condition that we've, in effect, got is that the rank of the matrix constructed from the two highest order coefficient matrix matrices BG. That then has the effect, these two conditions taken together, have the effect of eliminating the uh, possibility of the lag polynomial type transformation that we've been talking about. Just let me give a simple example. Again, on the assumption that there may be at least one person around who has the same taste for simple arithmetic that I have. Um, a two-equation example with nice simple numbers for anyone who wants to work out these things. 
determinants and so on. Um, we'll let P, the, order, the autoregressive order, be 2, and the moving average order be just 1. So we have something like that. Basically, this does not satisfy the conditions. Uh, the first condition is OK. In effect, if we look at the sufficient conditions, for the first statement, the determinant of B turns out to be relatively simple, but it is in fact only a third degree polynomial, not a fourth. Here, that thing, and sorry, I'm having to change panels in mid sentence. If we then look, if we look at the uh, other side, that also is not um, of the maximum possible degree, but is in fact only a first degree polynomial. Okay, in completing the sentence, those things obviously have no common factor. So there is no, as it were, redundancy in this specification. But the condition which fails is clearly the second condition. That is, if we look at the uh, highest order coefficient matrices, then we see that taking them together, even taking the two columns with non-zero terms, the result is indeed a singular matrix. And so in other words, in this case, BP or B2 and AQ or A1 does not have rank 2. So it's that condition that fails, which means, in other words, that we can generate a whole pile of observationally equivalent structures to this one by multiplying through by any old unimodular matrix. Okay, so suppose we just take the simple case of uh, the um, matrix that I was looking at a little while ago and put delta equal to some arbitrary numerical value, say a half, we can just multiply through and generate an alternative representation equally acceptable from the data point of view for, th for uh, representing the um, observed sample behavior of the uh, YT observations. And so if, just to give a simple example, um, let's note then the second condition fails. And an observationally equivalent structure is, and I'll write this one up because there is In about 10 minutes, I shall come back and make another point about it. In fact, if anyone wants to know where this came from, as I say, I took the matrix of the previous discussion and simply let delta take the value one half. Anybody else can spend, in effect, an infinite amount of time constructing observationally equivalent structures, because, as we said, there is an infinite number of unimodular matrices. So I don't recommend it. OK. Well, now, that um, lays the groundwork, in effect, for the set of results that I want to look at in terms of the econometric model, because the uh, particular result that I'm interested in in the second of the two Hannon papers that is on the sheet is basically, or can loosely be regarded as, grafting together conditions of this kind for identification of the standard vector ARMA model together with conditions of the classical kind in terms of identifying an econometric structure that is, identifying a structure which does not have a leading coefficient matrix of unity here. OK, remember, this has all been in the context of what an economist would call a reduced form type of model. And so let's, let's move on then. And uh, it will not be necessary to spend so much time on the details to the econometric model 
with MA errors. Um, and as I say, I shall simply take the one of the particular results which are given in the paper by Hannon Uh, which is probably the most, uh, on the one hand, accessible, and on the other hand, the most practically relevant. Um, notation is, as before, the degrees of these two polynomials on the left-hand side are R and S. So, in effect, you could say I'm abandoning the, the uh, notation P for the highest for the, for the order of the B of L polynomial. Implicitly, I suppose, I'm constrained to do that because we've just been working with a, f a form which can be regarded as a solution form of some underlying model, and now I'm going back to some structural form, and so I'm considering the possibility that this is a different specification from which a solution could have been derived. OK, the uh, normalization which I shall take following the Hannon paper is that the epsilons are independent. OK, now then the previous case then, the reduced form, type of case, um, let's just remind ourselves, had B0 equal to IG, And it's basically that condition which gets the final step insofar as restricting admissible transformations is concerned. Um, so let's say, and that, in effect, restricts U0 to be the unit matrix. In other words, in general terms, it will rule out transformations of the form we considered in the standard static econometric context, namely transformations by a constant matrix, or if you like, linear combinations of equations at a particular point in time. In other words, the specification that this is a unit matrix here, implicitly, you can't see it, but it's there, uh, means that if we consider transformations by some constant matrix, U0 it was, uh, that they can only be the unit matrix and preserve that particular uh, specification. Now, in this particular case, basically a rank condition on the, specif on the econometric model of the standard form does the same trick. All right? So if we consider then, the, having gone through all the rigmarole that we've just spent maybe too much time doing, to get the admissible transformation to be a constant matrix, then the question is how do we rule out um, observationally equivalent combinations of these equations at a particular point in time, the answer is we do it by a rank condition of the classical form. And that basically is all I want to say, uh, really, about the result from the second paper. Um, so let me make a note of that. Um, let's see. Um, here, a classical rank condition is required. So, in terms of uh, the second of the two Hannon papers on, the, on my list of references, I simply want to give this particular result. The second paper is the longer one, but I hope you'll understand now why um, the s amount of time spent on the two papers has been inversely proportional to their length. Um, so the conditions then, just to generalize, first of all, the conditions that we derived for the simple vector armor model, now to include the matrix of coefficients, current and lagged, <coughs> of the exogenous variables, these things, again, are relatively left prime. 
or if you like, have IG, the unit matrix, as a greatest common left divisor. Again, a sort of order preserving condition, that is that the order of the underlying processes Q, R, and S, sorry, the underlying polynomials Q, R, and S, cannot be changed in the sense in which we discussed it previously. And now, basically, a standard rank condition, which I guess I never did say at the outset, but assume that we all knew what it was. Now let me remind us. So we take the coefficient matrix, irrespective of the lag with which the variable we're looking at appears. In other words, we group together all the coefficients that we uh, have sitting around. First of all, all the A's, uh, the B's, and so on, the gammas. So we have a gigantic matrix of coefficients in the general case. So we would be surprised, I guess, if a rank condition wasn't satisfied, given the propensity of most economists to keep the number of variables they can think of at any one time down to the number of fingers on each hand. Um, maybe that that isn't for recording. <laughs> um, where was I? Obtained by taking. Those columns with assigned zeros in a particular row. has ranked G minus 1. So in other words, these two lines, a verbal statement is simply describing <coughs> the standard criterion matrix that one would look at to check the identifiability of a particular equation which was being restricted by exclusion restrictions. OK. You want to check? Basically, is one of the results in the uh, 71 paper of Hannon. Um, and I'll, in a moment, mention one of the others, which seems to be uh, interesting. Uh, I guess, having, uh, having come to the place where it seems everyone one scratches has a paper on identification, I should mention a couple of things that I've learned of recently. Um, the first is, in the context of arguments of this kind, I guess an argument by Alan Preston that conditions of this form constructed by, in the papers by Hannon, in a sense are somewhat stronger than the identification conditions that we would normally consider in the econometric context. What we normally do in the econometric context in the classical static form that I discussed at the outset is to take a particular model and seek conditions such that a particular structure within that model should be unique. So we take a model basically restricted in order to achieve identifiability and simply ask that any particular structure obtained by, for example, changing the numerical values of the parameters which are not restricted to be zero within that model should have the same reduced form. That's basically what we do. The fact is, of course, that any other alternative specification of a model connecting the same variables, the same endogenous and exogenous variables, will also have the same reduced form. And we exclude these from consideration in practice by taking a model as given. Okay, so we take a certain particular, as it were, economic theory and say, is it possible uniquely to deduce the relevant parameters within this um, model from the reduced form. And as I say, the possibility that an, exist that an alternative theory 
if you like, an alternative model, has the same reduced form, doesn't concern us. The particular theoretical structure is taken as given. Now, what Alan Preston points out, and I think correctly, is that this particular set of conditions is in effect something somewhat stronger. Because what we're seeking here is not simply a generalization of the classical type of condition, but we're seeking in effect a unique factorization of a final form, um, well, final form coefficient matrices into uh, beta, gamma, and moving average coefficients. So in seeking a unique factorization of a given final form into these coefficient matrices, what we're in effect doing is seeking one particular model uniquely for a given final form, which is something rather stronger than we would do in the classical case. As I say, in the classical case, what we typically tend to do is ignore the possibility that alternative models, as it were, alternative theories, might have the same reduced form, but simply seek conditions which will make a particular structure of a given model identified. And his argument is that, in effect, these conditions of this form go beyond that particular tradition. What we are, in effect, seeking is a unique model. And that's something which has not been traditionally of concern in the static identification literature. I disagree with that, Ken. I know you do, and now is your chance. Well, uh, it seems to me that uh, Hennon's approach and the classical approach is exactly the same one. The one specifies uh, restrictions on the coefficients and other restrictions to get from a particular model to a unique structure. Now, that's exactly what the classical stuff does, and that's exactly what uh, Hennon does, except that Hennon takes uh, an AMEX model, whereas uh, in the classical case, you've got uh, A of Z is the unit matrix, so that's the greatest common left divisor of B of Z, C of Z, of B of Z, gamma Z, and A of Z must be, must be I IQ or IG. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it seems to me that there is essentially no difference at all in concept between the Hennon approach and the other approach. Uh, I mean, one, if one specifies a different model, uh, one can get the same final, the same final form, but uh, obviously structures in that other model will be ruled out by uh, classical conditions and other conditions. I mean, I don't really see any difference, any difference whatsoever between yeah. the Hennon okay. stuff and uh, the classical stuff in concept. Well. As I say, it seems to me that what we're doing, what, what these conditions are seeking to do, is get a unique factorization of a particular final form structure, which is not what we do in the standard classical identification literature. That is, we don't take a reduced form and seek a unique factorization into B and gamma matrices. We say, if we have particular B and gamma matrices with zeros in there, specified by theory, is there a unique factorization now numerically? That is, are there other parameter values which correspond to an observed reduced form? And it seems to me that these conditions are, in effect, doing a little bit more than this. Now, I must admit, I only read Alan's paper over the weekend. Um, fortunately, it rained, so I <laughs> <laughs> gave it more time than I would otherwise have done. <laughs> uh, and so this is very much a first reaction. But I, I since... Uh, since I am where I am uh, located at the moment, it seems reasonable to, uh, to mention local thoughts on this subject. Yeah, I think we'd better take that up privately. But, uh, Fine. Well, the second thought I want to mention is one of yours. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so for a change, I'll mention uh, something by Bob Conn myself, rather than letting him do it. Um, basically, it is that what, what he has pointed out, if I understand him correctly, is that some of these conditions of the form that um, I've been discussing in, in either the original Hannon paper or, more, more importantly, the, the, uh, the sequel, the 71 paper, um, may need a little bit of strengthening to rule out one particular possibility, which has so far apparently not been ruled out. Remember, if we're thinking in terms of possible transformations, of a given model of this form, 
then what we've been doing all along is seeking restrictions on those transformations, as it were, in some sense sequentially, so that we could eventually have enough conditions which totally ruled out transformations, or if you like, enough conditions which restricted acceptable F of L matrices to be the unit matrix. And what seems to be, what seems to have been omitted is the possibility that we might consider a particular type of orthogonal transformation, which would nevertheless preserve by suitable uh, reordering of equations and so on, but in particular preserve the same structure for the error term that uh, we've assumed all along. And uh, what Bob Conn has done, has done in a paper, well, there is a very long paper which does a number of things, but one of the things in that paper is basically to slightly strengthen the conditions which in effect are summarized here for one particular theorem of Hannon's, slightly strengthen them to rule out that particular possibility. Fair? Yeah, the, the problem the problem arises uh, in the, in the moving average term uh, if one identifies purely from uh, the d's and the gammas, then no problem arises. Once you include the moving average term in there, right. there is an additional matrix. Uh, you get something like uh, u of z, a of z, d, and that's the yeah. matrix that's been eliminated. Okay. In effect, we, we're thinking of problems which arise in here, which could, in some sense, be in a loose sense, be laid at the door of the original. Uh, well, I, th I think of them as being laid at the door of the original over-parameterization, which exists in a vector-moving average process anyway. Clearly, a number of possibilities exist there, and it may be that we will have to be more careful to rule out various possibilities. Well, the final thing I want to do in discussing identification is to mention what was, in fact, present in this particular paper of Hannon's in some other statement of a theorem, but which has since been uh, discussed at much greater length uh, in a separate paper which I also refer to by Hatanako. And so let me uh, mention that. First of all, I guess I should give the attribution to Hannon, because it is there in his paper, although he tends to sort of rule it out as a sensible way to proceed. But basically, we're talking about we're going to be talking about a different type of restriction. Since Ted isn't here today, I can say a given and dismissed <laughs> without him jumping up and down. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's a fair statement and uh, discussed at greater length, which is certainly true. I don't think that's too unfair a description by Hat basically but the, the references the Hatanaka paper. I I can uh, rationalize it. Um, basically what we're going to look at is the standard model, but let me just write it out again because I want to emphasize in writing it out the first of the particular conditions, or let's say, not particular conditions, but general conditions under which we're working, <coughs> um, which is that we have, in writing ut for the error term, I'm abandoning the pretense, I guess would be a fair word, the pretense that we know what the particular representation that's relevant for a, a given case actually is. OK, so we're considering this particular model with no specification of the first point, the error structure. But given that there are statisticians in the audience, I should say accept stationarity. But in particular, we're not going to be saying, well, you know, we know the structural disturbance term has a moving average representation or an autoregressive representation or anything. And two, we don't specify the orders of the legs.
and I guess that uh, the claim Hatton Arkham makes here is correct, namely that this is, in empirical work, a much more realistic situation. Basically, we may have very good guidance from the standard analysis of economic theory, partial equilibrium analysis or whatever, as far as some particular static theory might, concern, might be concerned, but in practice we don't get very good guidance about the disequilibrium behaviour or the dynamic behaviour for a particular situation. And so we, in general, are not in a very strong position to give an a priori specification for the detailed lag structure of the beta or gamma coefficients, or for that matter, uh, for the error term. That, if anything, we, we get less guidance about from actual economic theory, of course, which we would normally think of as our source of prior information for the underlying structure. Well, now, what happens here is that in this, as I say, more realistic situation, we can consider identification, again, going back to the basic classical type argument, if we generalize the notion of what we mean by the exclusion of a variable from an equation. So far, we've been talking of situations, for example, as illustrated here, whereby an exclusion restriction, we simply mean the assignment of a zero value to some particular element of a row of this great huge matrix. Okay, that is, by an exclusion restriction, we simply mean taking out one particular variable at one particular point in time from an equation. What Hatanaka does is to generalize that, and as I say, it, it is also in the Hannon paper, by considering an exclusion restriction simply to be the assignment of a zero value to a whole polynomial element of the matrix. Or if you like, assigning a zero value to the relevant elements, not only in, for example, the B0 matrix, but of the corresponding elements in B1, B2, B3, up to Br as well. Okay, so when we think of excluding a variable from an equation, we take it out at all legs. Okay, so in other words, we, if you like, if we're talking about excluding the last variable from the first equation, we're now taking out not only the top right element of B0, but the top right element of B1 right through to the top right element of Br. And with that generalization of the notion of an exclusion restriction, basically what then happens is that classical rank and order conditions go through in exactly the same way. And that basically is the argument of, of Hatanaka's paper. I shan't give the proof. Um, it seems that one might be tempted to say intuitively obvious that one would be able to go through and get the same sort of proof. Um, so that's the basic idea. So generalizing the notion of the exclusion of a variable to cover um, the assignment of zero value to the polynomial, say, beta i j of l or gamma to make it clear we are talking about every single element within this polynomial um, Um, the, let's see, I'm, I think I'm still in the middle of a sentence. Uh, the, then leads to um, what I'll call the standard rank and order conditions. For example, just to take the, uh, just to give the, um, order condition, the necessary but not sufficient condition, e.g. we need at least g minus 1 such restrictions 
in any equation. In other words, that's what we need for identification. Now, uh, as I say, this, in a sense, seems um, not only a more realistic framework in which to operate, that is where we assume that nothing is known about the orders of the legs, but uh, I guess, in a sense, it seems a more realistic sort of framework within which to convey information or prior restriction from economic theory. That is to say, I would think it uh, somewhat tenuous in many economic situations, that d somewhat tenuous to be able to say that we have guidance from economic theory, that a particular variable enters a particular relationship at some point in time, but not at others. Okay, the guidance more li is more likely to be from the underlyingly static theory that if the variable, the variable enters or not, and that's it, with no statement as to um, if and when. Uh, okay, so that's, um, that's the basic result. Now, there is, uh, of course, one, I suppose one reservation ought to be expressed about this, which is, of course, in practice, if we're going to estimate a system of this form, then before we ever begin structural estimation, we do in fact have to say what these orders are. We can't just write down an equation with, these, with the degrees of these lags unspecified and uh, find a full information maximum likelihood program to estimate it. Before we start estimating, we have to actually say what these, what these orders are, even though it may be a view which we revise as we go along in much the same iterative way as I spoke of the time series identification procedures at the beginning of this talk. So it may well be in practice that given that we do have to put something down for these orders, these slightly more general conditions have some costs attached to them. And finally, I would just illustrate that in the context of the simple illustrative example which I used last time to say what those conditions would imply just to demonstrate the point that if we do assume something more about the dynamics or the stochastic specification, we will, of course, in practice, require to say something less in order to achieve identifiability. Um, so let's say the conditions may be <coughs> too strong. <coughs> given that lags must be specified for estimation. And if we take my simple example of last time, e.g. Um, in the uh, two equation autoregressive example, suppose uh, the model has two exogenous variables. If you remember the the general case I took was one in which the exogenous variables did not appear with any lags, but the numerical example I gave was a two-equation example with just a single exogenous variable. And we saw that there were situations in which that model might have been identified. Now, if the model has two exogenous variables, that is, and implicitly the rank of the matrix which I was calling P3 last time is 2, then our argument in that context was that the model was identified right, with just a single restriction. Uh, so let me, let me say what we were saying then. Um, given the lag structure, that is what I was assuming was a single lag in the endogenous variable vector, a first order autoregressive error. The argument then um, 
was that one exclusion and restriction of the traditional kind would do the trick. Let's say one zero coefficient would identify. Now this condition, of course, matches Hatanaka's condition if the variable being excluded from an equation is one of the two exogenous variables, because our assumption is that that variable in, that, in the setup of my simple example doesn't appear, didn't appear with any lags. However, if it happens to be the endogenous variable, one of the endogenous variables we're talking about, basically this condition is somewhat weaker than Hatanaka's condition, because remember, Hatanaka requires a variable being excluded, to be excluded at all points in time, that is, in the context of my simple first-order autoregressive example, to be excluded both in the current time period and in the one lag time period. And so in effect this just gives a very simple example of a situation where the weaker assumptions require stronger conditions. Or to put it the other way around, the stronger assumptions, given the lag structure, means that we can get out with much weaker conditions. Okay, so if we consider, um, let's say, this matches Hatanaka, if the excluded variable is exogenous, um, but if it is endogenous, he requires its exclusion in both time periods. OK, maybe the, possibly the details are not so fresh. Um, as, as they are for me, uh, but I guess the point will be made if we look if you look back a little bit. Of course, the um, other situation that we considered was, of course, the, possi the, the was the possibility that the model may be identified even if this particular condition was not met. Um, but I'm thinking of the standard case where we would assert the solution for the reduced form would come out very easily, and hence identifiability by the standard conditions. So what we're saying here is that, um, in practice, it may well be that we end up with slightly uh, stronger conditions than we might need, starting from the framework in which we did not speci make specifications of this form, given that in order to estimate the model, we do have to say something on these questions, even if we only say it very tentatively, and even if we have to modify it at the second round, and the third round, and the fourth round, depending how much time we've got. Um, nevertheless, since we do have to make statements about these two features, it may be that although the generalized exclusion idea is a particularly appealing one, it may turn out to be <coughs> somewhat strong in particular situations. And that's all I want to say about identification.